Welcome everyone to this month's uh, Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook webinar uh, presented by uh, NDSU Extension Agribusiness. My name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist who works primarily in bioproducts and bioenergy. I'll be the, the webinar host uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure many of you have joined us recently. Uh, we have a series of presentations uh, from different specialists in our section. Uh, we'll save questions until the end. Uh, we ask that we, you use the Q&A tool. We're using the webinar platform of Zoom. Uh, you're also welcome to use chat. We'll check those as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll save those questions. We'll address those questions at the end. Uh, but in the meantime, you're, you're welcome to uh, listen. Uh, and, and if you have questions in the meantime, you can submit them. We just won't get them uh, until later in the webinar. Uh, but uh, kind of kicking things off today, we have Frayne Olson. He's gonna talk about the WASDE report. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, so again, here's my contact information. I'll be providing a kind of a quick overview of what we learned in the WASDE report and how that's going to set us up as we move into um, the rest of, of uh, this month and actually into the month of August. So if you do have any uh, questions you think about later on, please feel free to email or use my cell phone. That's probably the most reliable given right now in the, in the summer months. So on my first slide, I just wanted to provide a little background on the pre-report industry estimates. So what was the industry expecting to see relative to what we actually got out of the WASU report this uh, on, on Monday? Um, so I'm, I am gonna go through both old crop ending stocks and new crop ending stocks. And the reason that's becoming so important is especially for soybeans, there's, there's been some concerns about whether we're gonna have enough beans to be able to make it through the end of the marketing year and into then the, the new crop year as, as harvest begins. I, I guess right now, I think the consensus view is that we will have enough inventories, but again, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna be monitoring this very, very closely. So just to recap very quickly, if you look at the top row, the average trade estimate, that's the average of the, of the people that are reported. There's usually about 12 to 15 different companies that are surveyed to say, what, would, what is your forecast for what USDA is gonna tell us coming into this report? So if you compare the top row to the bottom row, which is with the numbers that USDA actually did report, it gives us an idea of what did they expect to see versus what we actually got. Now, there really wasn't a, a lot of uncertainty or concern about the old crop ending stocks. We know that they're going to be very tight, but we're kind of narrowing in. We're getting close enough to the end of the marketing year. We typically don't see major, major changes. But I did want to put this uh, in play now just as a context. There were some small adjustments on the old crop corn numbers, uh, the old crop soybean numbers basically stayed the same. So no big shocks or surprises there. On the next slide, we have the same information. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, for the same information for new crop. Now on the new crop, if you look not only at what the average trade estimate is, but also the range between the highest and the lowest trade estimate, it gives you an idea that there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what our, our production and consumption will be for this coming crop year. So when we look at the average trade estimate, which is the top row versus the bottom row, um, you'll notice that on the wheat side, the, the ending stocks numbers tightened up a lot, uh, a lot quicker than I think a lot of the trade, trade was expecting. For corn, we were within the trade range, obviously, because the trade range is so wide. We're a little bit higher than the average, but not really a tremendous shock value. And then on the soybean side, kind of the opposite. We were, uh, excuse me, we also had a little bit more uh, ending stocks. The USDA came out with ending stocks a little bit higher than what the trade estimate was. But again, I want to, to, to caution everybody to also look at that range because that range is exceptionally wide. And most of that uncertainty in, the, in today's world is really coming out of the yields and the, and the production numbers. And I'll talk about that in, in more detail in a minute. So my next slide, the other thing that came out in this July report was we get the first um, estimates of wheat production by class. So up until this point, USDA has been forecasting wheat and wheat production and consumption in a, in, a, in a larger sense, but now we start breaking it down specifically by class, by state. So these are the first um, really solid estimates we have for wheat, uh, wheat production numbers. 
Now this would be for wheat production. How many total bushels are going to be produced? Uh, just like the other graphics, the top row uh, highlighted in, in black is what the average trade estimate was. The bottom row highlighted in red is the, the, the numbers we actually got out of USDA. So if we look in aggregate, if we look at all, all wheat combined, the far left-hand column, you know, it was a little bit, it was kind of towards the lower end of the range, but definitely within the range. However, when we start breaking it down by class, this is where we start getting some differentials. And these differentials in production are, are actually going to play out and are playing out right now in, in the relative prices we see for the different wheat classes. Because I've been getting a lot of questions over the last several days. We've been getting some strength in the spring wheat market. The question is, well, how high will spring wheat go? The challenge we're facing is spring wheat, even though um, uh, production is gonna be way down on spring wheat, our ending stocks are gonna be much tighter. We still have this larger winter wheat crop that we have to deal with. So let's talk about winter wheat for just a moment. If you look at what the average trade guess was for hard red winter wheat versus the number that came out is a little bit larger. So the winter wheat crop based on the early harvest reports now coming out of Oklahoma and Kansas is that it's yields are pretty strong, Quality profile is good. Average proteins are a little bit lower than what we would typically see, but not horribly bad. The other thing that was a little bit of a surprise was the soft red winter wheat, that the soft red winter wheat numbers were a little bit stronger from a production side than the trade was expecting. So when we look at our two major winter wheat classes, hard red and soft red, we have a few more bushels than it had first, be, first, first been expected. Now on the soft red side, we are starting to rebuild some inventories. The soft red winter wheat inventories have been very, very, very tight. And so these additional production numbers will help give us a little bit more of a buffer in the soft red winter wheat market. I'm gonna skip over white wheat for, for right now. That was, a, um, I, I think the trade was expecting a little bit more of a cut primarily because of the very, very hot dry conditions out in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of the white wheat we grow in the US is, is both in Washington, Oregon and Idaho. And so it's kind of that PNW region that has the white wheat. There is some white wheat that's produced in um, Michigan as well, but uh, the smaller acreages. Um, I want to zero in a little bit on spring wheat in Durham. And this is, again, not necessarily a surprise because we, we do know that this region is obviously having some pretty severe drought conditions. We're starting to get a better read or figure on what our yield and yield potential may be. Um, I recently traveled out to Western North Dakota and in, in my drive across the state, I saw a lot of variation. There are some areas where the wheat was actually looking pretty decent. Uh, there was other areas where it was just absolutely horrible. So we're, we're trying to figure out, given this wide variation in, in, in crop conditions, um, some areas of the state have had rains, others have not. The timing of the rains are really critical. You know, this is all kind of playing into this level of uncertainty. So on the spring wheat side, now this is all other spring wheat, so, but most of this is hard red spring that we grow up here in the Northern Plains. The, the production numbers were actually on, on definitely on the low end of the range. In fact, it was lower than the lowest trade estimate. So that was a bit of a surprise to the spring, to the spring wheat market. Um, I think they, the average trade was expecting a little higher numbers than what we actually got. My personal opinion in studying the numbers for, for expected yields out of uh, North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, I do think the USDA came pretty close. I, I, based on what I saw, my assessment and talking to farmers and the, some of the county agents, I think they're relatively close in, in the average yield estimates for the state and the region. The other kind of big shocker for the, for the wheat market was the Durham. Um, so if you look at what the average trade estimate was and the range of the trade estimates, now recognizing also, to be fair, there aren't as many private analysts that will do specific um, forecast for, uh, for the wheat by class. So we're not looking at, at the, the pool of people that are doing this kind of forecasting for corn and soybeans and wheat in general, all bundled together, is relatively large, but there's a smaller subset that will do specifics by class. The moral of the story is that, yes, our Durham stocks are going to be uh, pretty tight. And as I listen to and try and read and study what's going on in the Canadian side of the line, both spring wheat uh, as well as Durham production in Canada are also under a lot of pressure now. They've been getting a few more rain showers than we have here in North Dakota, but it's not really been enough to make a large difference. We're still looking at a smaller crop coming out of, out of Canada also. So this now has kind of set the stage for not only overall wheat prices in the wheat complex, 
But now we're starting to also look at what is the relative prices between these different wheat classes. All right, on my next slide, I do want to uh, give you, a, 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 again, a little higher level of where are, what, is, what is the change in the ending stocks. So I really want to focus on those blue bars on the bottom, which is a percent ending stocks. It's our ending stocks number divided by total use. So think of it as what percentage of our needs, of our total needs, are we going to have in reserve just before harvest? And please notice now for old crop wheat, oh, excuse me, old crop corn, which would be um, the, the new crop corn and the forecast is in the red on the far right-hand side. Just to the left of that is old crop corn. So our old crop or corn stocks relative to history are pretty low. We're seeing um, forecasted ending stocks as a percentage, very similar to what we saw back in the 2013, 13, 14 time period, which is relatively low. Now it's not record low. If you look back on the left-hand side of the chart, you get into that 1995, 96 timeframe, and they were actually much smaller percentage-wise than they are today. One of the reasons that the, the corn crop or corn market is starting to have kind of a schizophrenic kind of personality here is we're getting this uh, divergence now between what's happening in the old crop and our expectations for new crop. Now, please understand that red bar on the right-hand side is assuming that we're gonna have trend line yields for corn. Okay, so the trend line yield is the number that's currently being plugged into um, the, the, the production and consumption numbers. And that's just under 180 bushels per acre national average yield. Now, there's a lot of folks that are starting to raise some questions given the dry conditions we're starting to see show up in particular in the Western Corn Belt. Are those yields achievable? And, and again, this is going to be the hotly debated topic from now until the combines run. So from now until we start harvest and start getting some actual yield reports, we're going to have very differing opinions about what the size of the crop is and what our yield potentials will be. So please understand, even though it looks like we're going to have some larger a rebuilding of these inventories, that's being hotly debated right now whether that will actually happen or not. But what, what tends to happen is as that ending stocks number, as that gets gets smaller, as that gets tighter, we, two things happen. Average prices increase and prices become more volatile or more variable. So again, be paying attention to um, the weather forecasts and, and, and any discussion about kind of yield and, and crop stress. In particular now, as we get into later July, first part of August, we get into the pollination stages and, and reproductive stages for corn. The next slide, we have the exact same thing for soybeans. Now, please notice again on the far right-hand side and highlighted in red is the current forecast for ending stocks of new crop soybeans. That's a, it's a tiny, tiny increase over old crop supplies, which is just a tiny, tiny increase from our record lows that we saw back in 2013-14. In, um, so we are exceptionally tight on our, our soybean supply demand conditions. Again, the red bar that we see right there is assuming a trend line yield a trend line yield of just under 51 bushels per acre national average yield. Same questions are going on for soybeans. Given what we see happening now with the weather forecast, with soil moisture conditions and crop development, do we really have the pot potential nationwide to be able to have, to be able to, to see that occur? And we're seeing this real differencing now between the yield expectations for the Western Corn Belt versus the Eastern Corn Belt. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The next slide is the exact same kind of percentage carryover stocks for all wheat. Now this is all wheat classes blended together. So we're not breaking it down by class, it's just wheat is wheat. And you can see we have been taking those ending stocks numbers down. Um, I usually consider on an all wheat basis, the kind of that typical range of carryover between 30 and 35%, it kind of in the modern era of wheat right now, which is right now towards the lower end of normal, but we're not nearly as low or small as what we saw in that 2007, 2008 time period where we had exceptionally low prices and we had that price spike that kind of everybody remembers in the spring of 2008. The next slide is the same supply demand conditions, but for spring wheat only. And this is really where the big shift has come. When you look at what we, what we saw and expected in the June report versus what we're seeing now in the July report, 
those this is very different we did take those production numbers the yield numbers down pretty significantly in spring wheat which is now really starting to tighten up our ending stocks and our expectations for carryover for the hard spring wheat and that's uh, obviously the reason we're starting to see some additional strength in spring wheat markets okay next slide i want to talk a little bit about this price spread now between spring wheat and winter wheat and and this is where uh, the question is, what's kind of the high end? How, how high can spring wheat prices go? And the challenge is spring wheat prices, because it's a relatively small market compared to all wheat, and in particular compared to corn and soybeans, it only has so much strength to work independently from all of the other kind of wheat classes, as well as from the other commodities. So what I charted here, and I pulled this this morning, kind of mid-morning uh, before we came on today, and what this is, is the price differential, that price spread between hard red spring wheat uh, on the Minneapolis exchange and the Kansas City hard red winter wheat futures traded on the Chicago border trade. So if you take uh, Minneapolis spring wheat minus Kansas City winter wheat, what's that price differential? And this, this is a long-term continuation chart. It goes back into about the 1990s. And you can see that price relationship. Let's ignore for just right now, please just ignore what happened in, two, in the spring of 2008. That was kind of an anomaly. Some really, really strange things happened to cause that, that big spike. But if we look at more from like 2010 forward, we say how much of a premium can spring wheat have over the winter wheat markets? And it looks as though we're getting to the top end of that price differential, that price range. So the moral of the story is we have this spring wheat market trying to make a rally, an independent run by itself, but it only can separate itself so far from hard red winter wheat, which is really from a volume standpoint, a much larger class of wheat. And notice what happens. We can, we can get to about this $2.50 spread differential, and then all of a sudden it starts to contract again. Now, what that means is either spring wheat prices will fall relative to winter wheat, or there's enough momentum that the winter wheat market will also be pulled up. So we're, we're just talking about this price differential. The moral of the story, what I'm trying to get at is we have very large adequate supplies of hard red winter wheat. And in the global market, there is plenty of hard red winter wheat available in the global market. Even though some of the supply demand conditions are tightening up a little bit, there's still plenty of supplies. And we have very, very stiff competition from Russia. So the biggest concern right now in the hard red winter wheat market is what's happening with corn prices. Because if corn prices get too high and the hard red winter wheat market doesn't stay at a premium to corn, we start feeding more corn, in particular in the poultry sector. So the, the bottom line is, if we're trying to figure out how high can spring wheat prices go, we really need to look at what's happening in winter wheat and also what's happening in corn. So if we continue to have some strength in the corn market, that allows the hard red winter wheat market to also increase, which then allows the spring wheat market to continue to move up. So I know that seems like a kind of a complex set of relationships, but in today's market, that's really what we're seeing. So please understand if you're looking at the spring wheat market, you cannot look at spring wheat independent of the other wheat classes or independent of corn. Next slide, please. So really quick, drought monitor map. I, you know, everybody knows kind of what's happening in North Dakota. I know Tim is gonna talk a little bit more specifically about what's happening in North Dakota. I wanna point out to a couple other states that are impacting, again, those larger corn and soybean markets. Let me focus in a little bit on what's happening in South Dakota. We know that South Dakota has, is, is also exceptionally dry. We've got some really challenges going on. I talked to some folks, from some farmers from South Dakota here recently, and they said, yeah, you know, this is, we're in pretty tough shape as well. The newer developments and the part that the corn and soybean market is watching really closely is Southern Minnesota and Iowa. So I, I really want you to focus in your eyeballs on what's going on in Minnesota and in particular in, in Iowa, those two regions. We're getting this separation of the Eastern Corn Belt versus the Western Corn Belt. Now the dividing the imaginary line between East and West is usually the Mississippi River. So if you're west of the Mississippi River, you're kind of Western Corn Belt. And that's really what we're talking about here. Eastern Corn Belt, Iowa, Illinois, um, um, no, not Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri. Those guys are all getting some rains. 
Their crop condition and ratings are much, much better than they are in the Western Corn Belt, which is primarily Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota. So we've got this dichotomy going on. So we, there's a lot of focus and attention on how dry is it getting in Iowa and Southern Minnesota, but we can't forget that there's the possibility to partially compensate for losses there with the higher yields that we're getting potentially in the Eastern Corn Belt. So next slide, please. One of the ways that we try and monitor this is actually using um, some satellite imagery. And this is, I, I, I stole this from uh, the, the lockup briefing. Basically, this is the briefing that the, the secretary of the, the um, in USDA, the chief economist gets briefed before all this information is released to the public. And they, they, they provide a copy of the slide deck that, that the um, economists use to, to brief the, the chief economist. And this is one of the slides that I wanted to point out. This is vegetative health index. So this is some satellite imagery saying how green is the crop? And it does give a proxy, a rough proxy for, well, where are the areas of the state that we've got a really healthy crop coming versus an area of the, of the, of the U.S. where we've got some problems showing up? Now, it does match up and, and trace pretty well with that drought monitor maps, but not identically. And again, what the area that the, the markets are watching very, very closely right now for corn and beans is that Southern Minnesota and Northern Iowa region. And you can see that there are some of those regions now that are starting to get dry and the crop conditions are starting to suffer. And as we get into pollination for corn as well as flowering for soybeans, this is gonna become pretty critical. Next slide, please. One of the, even though it's, it's a subjective uh, assessment, this is this crop progress report, which comes out every Monday morning is followed very, very closely. And I just want to highlight a couple of things to give, give some perspective here. In most cases, when you, when you read press reports, they're looking at the very bottom block that I've highlighted in, in red. So this is kind of the, the average across all of the corn producing, or at least the, the major corn producing states. And typically what we say is what percentage of the crop is rated in that good to excellent category? We, we add the column for good and the column to excellent together, and we get a proxy for an idea of, well, what percentage of the crop is looking pretty good versus what areas or what, uh, what percentage of the crop may be having some issues. So there's two ways to interpret this. We can compare this week's numbers relative to last week's numbers. So is the crop conditions improving or getting worse? But we also look at it from how are we doing this week, this year versus the same week last year. So let's compare this year to last year. Well, if we look from week to week change, there really wasn't a lot of difference. But when you compare the, what the crop condition ratings today versus what we saw last year at this time, when you look at corn in general, you know, they're not dramatically different. They were a little bit better, but not dramatically different. So now we dig a little bit deeper into which states, where are the regions that are starting to have some problems? What are the areas that we need to focus on? So I've highlighted in blue two different regions. I've got Illinois, Indiana on Iowa, the I states, and then I also highlighted um, Minnesota. So let's look at some of the differences between what's going on in Illinois and Iowa and Minnesota. And if you add up that good to excellent category for Illinois, you add up the good to excellent category for Iowa, you get almost the identical number. So what's going on? If there's, if, if there's such a big problem in Iowa, why are this crop condition ratings or the crop progress looking so strong in Iowa? It's because again, this is a visual assessment, right? And we do know that some of the Iowa crop is starting to show some stress. So depending upon the weather forecasts, we will likely see the Iowa numbers start to slip. We're gonna see less and less in that good and excellent category and some more showing up percentage wise in that fair to poor category, all depending upon what's going on with rainfall and what's going on with, on with temperatures. Now contrast that to Minnesota. If we look at what's in good to excellent ratings from Minnesota, it's a very, very different condition. Southern Minnesota is in a little bit better condition than central Minnesota, but only marginally so. So we're starting to see some of these wrinkles show up or some of these problem areas get to a point as the crop is developing and maturing that we're starting to see these crop condition ratings fall. And so again, this is information that the market uses, whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. This is the information that people are trading off of. 
So the next slide is the exact same thing. Um, weekly crop progress for soybeans, very similar story. When we look at the conditions this week versus last week, they're identical. When we look at conditions this week versus la the same time last year, it's a little bit weaker, but not substantially weaker. But again, you start doing some state by state comparisons and the, the states that are having some problems are obviously starting to show up. North Dakota, South Dakota, we definitely have some issues with both the corn and soybean ratings, but even the Minnesota ones are starting to slip a little bit. Next slide is the same thing for spring wheat. Now, again, this shouldn't come as a shock for it to anybody that's listening. We are having some problems, obviously, with this, uh, the, the, the condition scores and for the ratings of, of the spring wheat crop. We already know this. The real question now is, as we start to finish out this filling phase and we start moving into harvest, how many of those, those kernels that are actually in the head are gonna be shrunken and broken? How many are actually gonna be able to fill out to a point where they're harvestable? And of course, if you have some, some, some wheat that's only you know, six or eight or 12 inches tall, how do you get that through the combine? So you know, is the yield we have out there really harvestable? We're also getting some reports of some of the, the uh, wheat acres being hayed for livestock feed, which is obviously a very legitimate question and something that um, both Tim and, and, and Ron Haugen will be talking about next. All right, I think I got one more slide if I remember correctly. I just want to show the precipitation forecast for the next five days. This is coming out of National Weather Service. I pulled this uh, late last night. Um, it just shows that those areas that have been getting rainfall are now continuing to get some rainfall. Those areas that are missing some of these rain showers, it seems as though they're continuing to miss some of those showers. So this is the information the markets are watching right now. This is going to be very, very sensitive. We're going to continue to see a lot of market volatility as we move through the next uh, several weeks. And with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, NDSU Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Go to my first slide today and I'm going to talk, uh, you know, the drought is affecting the cattle market and uh, particularly affecting us in North Dakota. Frayne has already showed you the drought monitor on the lower left hand side and I just focused in on North Dakota on the top to show you the most severe conditions now are right up in the bullseye of the state up there and where it's really, really dry and and a, a lot of problems with pastures. Actually down in the Southwest, there are areas that have improved. And, you know, Frayne and I talked about this. You can go five miles, particular down Southwest North Dakota, you can go five miles from it being pretty green to to uh, very to, to to nothing, and so quite variable as as Frayne mentioned. Uh, I just uh, talked to my counterparts, and we can look at the U.S. map down there. And then to the right is uh, Frayne mentioned uh, crop conditions, poor to very poor, and so on for the crops. And so I've got the very poor to poor conditions for pastures shown on the bottom right hand side and corresponds to the drought monitor but I just like I started saying just talked to my counterparts in Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, Mississippi and uh, Tennessee in a, in a conference call uh, just this week and the one thing that they all said is it's been cooler than normal and wetter than normal. In fact, their biggest complaint is that they can't get their hay up because it's too wet. So when we start thinking about the cattle market and the impact of drought, yes, drought is having an impact. But on the other hand, there are, uh, are a lot of cattle that are in, in very good uh, grazing areas. And that's uh, important because uh, now with the higher corn prices, we're wanting to graze cattle longer and, and, and put calves, for instance, on grass, keep them longer rather than in the feedlot. And we'll see in a minute here, the spark in feeder cattle uh, prices. And that's coming from that area down to the south of us, Oklahoma, only 4% poor to very poor and up into uh, Kansas and Nebraska and even Eastern Colorado. Colorado was very, very dry last year and they've gotten good rains down there. So that's actually uh, helping prices. Um, you know, our producers here now are asking 
a lot of questions. First of all, how much should I reduce the herd? Uh, what alternative feeds are there? And planning for next year, of course, is very, very important. And in, in what our price is going to be next year. If prices are going to be poor, maybe I should, you know, really cut down or, or bail out. But if they're going to be better, maybe I should try to look at some alternative feeds and, and, and do something to at least keep a base cow herd. And that's kind of what I'm re uh, recommending. There's no cookbook for every producer is different and we've got different conditions and so on. But my recommendation is, yeah, I think for a lot of us, particularly up in that North Central, you're gonna to have to continue to reduce herds and you're doing that. But on the other hand, be important to keep a base herd because as we'll see in a minute, uh, we do expect higher prices in the next year or two. So go to the next slide. Um, you know, here's rugby years right up in the epicenter of drought and typically this time of the year rugby might be selling go every other week with a sale and sell 100 cows or something and this is Monday sale of rugby almost 1400 cattle and they're selling pairs up there which obviously is expected in very, very dry conditions up there so move to the next slide. Uh, We'll take a look at prices, starting with fed cattle prices, because I know we don't feed a lot of cattle up here, but fed cattle prices and corn prices are the two most important things that are affect feeder cattle. And so uh, I've got the last three complete years on here and uh, with the uh, the light blue being 2018, the green 2019, the purple 20, and now the red line this year. And so focus on the red line of this year and what's happening next year. Fed cattle prices have steadily improved throughout the year. And, uh, you know, we did up here 124, a few 125 cattle and a little bit lower than that in the Southern Plains. So we're averaging out there about 123, but we've seen improvement. The red bars are the futures for the remainder of the year. And then the orange or tan bars or squares that are on top are 2022 futures. So uh, on the fed cattle side, you see prices right now are higher than they've been the last three years, way higher than they were last year with COVID, but even higher than 2018 and, and 19, back similar to 2017 uh, prices, coming from both lower supplies and uh, very robust demand. The lower supplies, of course, is we've reduced, we'd reduced the cow herd in 2019, reduced to the beef cow herd in 2019, again in 2020, and looking at the drought monitor, at least in the Northern Plains and West, I think that'll be enough to at least to, uh, probably reduce it a little bit more uh, this year. And so those lower numbers are obviously supportive to prices and are already starting to, uh, to show up. And uh, so looking at the, at the futures then by the end of the year, we're up there over 130, up there to 132. And then next year we've got futures, April futures and, and by you know some seasonal weakness in mid-year as usual, but by the end of 2022 at the beginning there in April and the end, we're right up there pushing $140, the best prices we've seen since uh, 2016 and 17. So we do expect uh, better prices. And again, based on lower supplies and demand, go to the next slide, I just hit a couple there. Uh, Brian isn't on today to talk about macro and I'm certainly not a macro economist, but he just here are some signs of how the economy is doing. Again, we've, you know, the, the vaccinations and people, restaurants opening up and food service and, and all that is really, uh, helping uh, beef demand and and you see the Dow Jones Industrial Average on the top there at record levels in the last couple of days up to to been improving and up to record levels we've got help wanted signs everywhere drive through you know, right next door to us is a gas station and across the street of fast food and they've got big signs help wanted and all over so you know that's certainly helping beef demand and funneling into these prices go to the next slide the other part of the demand equation then are exports 
And again, on the export side, we're doing gangbusters there, a record exports on the top. The, we just got the new data at the end of last week and, uh, and uh, uh, beef exports have been setting records the last several months. Again, way higher last year, we were affected by COVID, but look at the average there. And so we're doing record exports, expect those to continue. And, you know, what's really nice to see in those exports is our prices are higher. Our, our, our wholesale beef prices are high and at the same time we're exporting a lot. And, uh, and we've had kind of had a change in where it goes in the bottom. You see that China has really picked up last year. I think China was down about our 10th best customers and they've moved up now to our third best customer only behind uh, Japan and Korea. And so we're sending record amounts to Korea and about the same to Japan that we always do and then China's picked up. And so we expect record exports this year and at least near record exports next year. And so that's another thing that's funneling into those fed cattle prices. So go to the next slide. Uh, here's our calf prices and uh, uh, there's 550 to six weight calf prices. And again, there, look at the, the, the colors are the same in the years, the last three years. And so you see, uh, you know, we have sparked calf prices here in the last month or so. And, and uh, in, in a little bit, I'll talk more about corn, but anyway, that's, we got lower supplies. And, uh, and uh, then you see those good condi grazing conditions to the south, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Eastern Colorado, and, and so on, and, and the lower supplies. And so, uh, you know, the prices aren't as high relative to fed cattle prices because of the higher corn prices. But right now it looks like we will do better than uh, 2018 again, if we maintain that with the big question mark of, of being corn. So we're gonna have better, uh, prices on the fed cattle side that funnels down into feeder cattle and another reason if that you know if we can hang on here and and, and keep a base cow herd uh, for, for the, you know take advantage of better prices in the next couple of years we certainly should consider that so go to the next slide is the uh, corn and again why we what's helped on the feeder cattle here in the last couple of months is that uh, corn in Oklahoma has went down over a dollar, but I've got all kinds of question marks here. You see, just in the last couple of weeks, it's been jittery, you know, when the, the, the acreage report and so on uh, came out, you know, we were up the limit uh, one day and last week, one day we're down the limit. And so the, as Frayne mentioned so eloquently, we got a very, volatile situation going on there and what's going to happen and look at Iowa and southern Minnesota and and all that so uh, you know what are corn prices going to do remember that old saying is change corn prices 10 cents change fall calf prices a buck in the opposite direction so that's the big thing we got to watch for for fall calf prices go to the next slide then are the heavier weight yearling prices and we see the same thing there prices now have moved up till above the last three years and uh, the we do have a futures market for these heavyweight yearlings so uh, move on to the rest of the year again we're right up there with the prices we had in 2018 and by the end of the year uh, futures at least now up there at 163 and so on are much higher than they were even in 2018 back to 2016 levels and then the futures the orange futures there on the upper left hand side of the chart up there at 165 you know significantly higher than the last several years so a lot of optimism there again based on smaller supplies and strong demand and and those distant uh, live cattle futures uh, trading quite well now doesn't mean it had you know something can come along and happen and we've seen that in the last couple of years so you know that is a little worrisome but right now the fundamentals there are looking good and the futures market is uh, is reflecting that but you never know when something drastic comes along too so we're kind of holding our breath on the situation so move to the next slide uh, talk about cow prices and cow prices over the past few years haven't been as variable. In fact, uh, last year at this time, they'd picked up 
uh, quite a bit simply because remember last year the shelves were bare of, of, of hamburger and people were wanting to cook at home and were, they just had to stay at home and so on and so cow prices were had, had moved up last year above the previous two years and we're right up there on you know where they've been the last few years and so uh, that is in spite of uh, higher quite a bit higher beef cow slaughter that we'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, several things going on again, uh, the entire meat complex, the protein complex prices have moved up for broilers and, and pork and beef as well. And so, you know, hamburger is a, a lower cost item and so uh, selling very well at the store and that's uh, helping out the, the uh, call call prices. And then the other thing is we're, uh, our imports are down. Australia is rebuilding the herd. So, uh, and, and then China is buying beef from them because they're a lot closer than, than the U.S. is. So we've got some good fundamentals there supporting the uh, call call market, which, you know, we've got a lot of call cows coming to market in North Dakota now. And and uh, so, you know, at least we've got uh, decent prices selling, e e even though we've got some forced movement there. So go to the next slide. Um, there's the higher beef cow slaughter. You see the blue line on the top. And again, last year, uh, a kind of a poor comparison because we had all the issues with uh, packing plants closed and so on. But our uh, the last several weeks there, uh, three weeks, you see slaughter similar to what it was last fall when our peak slaughter numbers are in the fall when culling takes place. So that's the drought showing up there and and, and cows coming to market. And, and uh, so, uh, uh, again, and kind of another reason why I think we're going to reduce the beef cow herd again this year, which again, overall would be supportive to prices. So let's finish up with my last slide. Then again, I do believe that there are better cattle prices ahead. And, and you know, I know we're suffering in North Dakota now, and we do have forced liquidation and a really tough situation out there. You know, we'll open up CRP uh, haying at least by August 2nd, if we don't uh, get any emergency before that. And so some other things. Uh, and so I I know, uh, you know, you, pr producers are looking at al alternative feed sources. And so if we can at least uh, maintain some cows, I think, to help us when things get uh, with, with the better prices that I think are ahead, you know, something to consider. So with that, let's go to Ron. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, Ron Haugen, Extension Farm Management. And I was going to talk to you uh, about a new rule that just came down uh, from uh, RMA on, on prevent plant. So uh, the next uh, slide, uh, basically here's the title. Producers now can hay and graze or chop cover crops anytime and still receive their uh, prevent plant payment. So the next slide, um, this is just from the, their news release, which, was, was, which USDA put out on July 6th. Um, and it basically says you can, you can uh, uh, if you have crop insurance and you've had prevented plant, you can, you can uh, use it for, uh, uh, use your cover crop for silage or hay and still receive 100% of your prevent plant payment. Um, typically, if you wanted to do that, you could do it, but you, you would be reduced by 65%, which is a big cut, okay? Um, but now after November 1st, uh, then you can, you're always been, you have been able to do this. So the next slide, um, Basically, it's it's part of the USDA and RMA. They want to be flexible and help it, trying to help people out as much as possible. And there there's a big believer in in cover crops, uh, important for reducing erosion and and boosting soil health. The next slide then shows a couple quotes then from our from the acting administrator uh, Flournoy, uh, just uh, saying that we're uh, that they're working diligently with federal crop insurance programs to help manage risk. And they're dedicated uh, to, to the needs, uh, needs of agriculture and they do support the use of cover crops. And the next slide then is, is important. RMA recognizes that the cover crops are not planted uh, as an agricultural uh, um, commodity. They're planted for conservation benefits. And for the 2021 crop year and beyond, RMA will, will consider a cover crop planted uh, to be 
uh, to be a prevent plant cl a claim to be a second crop, but RMA will continue to consider um, the cover crop harvested for grain or seed to be a second crop, and it remains subject to the reduction of that 65%. So what that's saying that 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 RMA will the, the rule is permanent until it's changed, I guess, but it's permanent that you can hay or graze the cover crop, but you cannot use it for grain or seed, then you will get the big cut in the payment. So the next slide, the last slide, um, this just says that, that it allows the flexibility for the 2021 crop year uh, and that, that uh, it's in line with the, with, with, the, with the goals of the 2018 Farm Bill for cover crops and good farming practice. And with all of these rules that come down, please contact your crop insurance agent and FSA before you do anything. So with that, I will turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economics Specialist. Uh, hopefully, uh, sound is a little bit better this go around. Uh, some general comments about things that are going on. Uh, it's been actually a lot of news uh, in the energy space the last month, uh, so I'm happy to get a chance to talk to you. Um, starting with corn ethanol, just in general, uh, where we've seen almost a complete recovery of ethanol production uh, to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the, the rates of production the last few weeks are really on par with uh, pre-COVID in the summer. And again, we have uh, additional demand use in the summertime with the summer driving season and corn ethanol industry is, is, has met that. Uh, one thing I do have up uh, are the South Dakota crush numbers. Again, these are from USDA uh, egg marketing service. They don't have North Dakota numbers. We use South Dakota numbers. And their crush margin is actually a little bit low. Um, typically, uh, my rule of thumb is it's 75 cents to cover operating and $1.50 to cover operating and capital. So we're in a place where we're covering op operating, but not much better. And a lot of this is being driven by higher corn prices in South Dakota, um, which again, you might sit back and think, you know, how much of this is being driven by the drought and concerns about those local supplies. But in general, the the, the the position of the industry is actually quite positive uh, despite a variety of news uh, that, that's been coming up. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about, which is bad news for the industry, is the Supreme Court ruling in late June uh, regarding small refinery waivers. So this has been an issue for the last four years. Uh, the, the previous uh, the EPA under the previous administration issued a large number of small refinery waivers. That allowed these smaller refineries to, to make claims of uh, economic harm uh, be due to the renewable fuel standard uh, and possibly be issued waivers for their annual obligation. So that uh, kind of came about and there were a large number of waivers for a few years. Uh, starting last year, they, they started piling up. They weren't making decisions. Uh, EPA was making decisions. And actually at about that time, the 10th Circuit Court uh, ruled that, that EPA had been mis misapplying the rules. And it came down to this issue of language. And so the, the 10th Circuit Court made a decision one way and the Supreme Court a few weeks ago flipped it the other way. And the whole idea, and this is an issue of semantics, is what exactly does an extension mean? So according to the 10th Circuit Court and those in the minority on the Supreme Court, they thought that the extension would have to be continuous. That is that each year, small refineries would have to apply for this extension. And the first year that they didn't, they'd no longer be able to. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the majority decided that that wasn't the case, and that is that these small refiners could come back in any future years, and that's what an extension means. Uh, it, it's interesting right now because there are a pile of waivers that EPA has to make a decision on, and again, that'll impact, uh, not necessarily, it shouldn't impact the total uh, re renewable number, although in the past few years it has. Uh, but we're really kind of wondering exactly what this is going to mean for, for future EPA decisions uh, regarding the, the RVO, those annual numbers, and then those specific refinery numbers. In addition to those small refinery, refinery applications kind of piling up, we're actually piling up in terms of actually setting the, the, those annual numbers. The thought right now is that EPA sometime is going to issue numbers for uh, a number of years uh, to catch up and then kind of get ahead of, of their, their responsibility in that place. Uh, another round of bad news came out uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, this was uh, the DC District Court of Appeals. Uh, they decided that EPA had overstepped its bounds, uh, that it had exceeded its authority in allowing E15 sales. Uh, 
previous law under the Clear, Clean Air Act limited uh, the use of, of ethanol to 10% blends uh, due to concerns about re vapor pressure. So this is essentially how fast uh, a, a liquid vaporizes. And you know, in the summertime, it gets a little bit warmer. So there's non-containment parts of the country where they want that, that number to be a little bit tighter. Uh, and, and ethanol changes it a, a little bit. They had, they, there was a, a waiver for E10. Uh, EPA uh, under the Trump administration said, you know, there's substantially similar fuels and that within the spirit of the law that E15 should work, uh, the, the Court of Appeals decided otherwise. And in fact, they didn't even have a ruling formally per se. They just said flat out, it was, you know, what EPA had done was, was wrong. And they really didn't need to say much more than that, which was interesting. Um, Importantly, this won't affect this driving season, um, but we'll see what happens in the future. Right now, the, the industry and industry groups are talking about different remedies. Uh, there's been a couple of bills introduced uh, in Congress uh, to allow E15, as, as, as well as you know, pursuing appeals on this and other potential regulatory remedies. I, you know, it is kind of disheartening for the industry. E15 sales have been small, but been growing relatively uh, quickly year over year, and we're kind of a bright spot in that bigger space, especially for, for market growth moving forward. It's also interesting, uh, as in, in some respects, this damages the, the competitiveness of the, the liquid fuels, uh, including petroleum-based fuels, as there's this push to decarbonize. And by doing this, essentially, the petroleum folks are kind of uh, duking it out with their, their partner in this now, in the biofuels industry saying, you know, we don't want E15. Well, the use of E15 would have been a, a lower carbon fuel than E10 and supported th those competitive notions uh, that are becoming more and more important. Oops. Uh, next thing I wanna talk about just really quickly is what's going on in North Dakota in terms of oil. These are some numbers I've been watching really closely the last few months, um, because we've seen this, this rapid increase a, a recovery of, of, of oil prices. And now we're, we're seeing spot prices, West Texas Intermediate is the North American benchmark for oil. Now in the mid seventies, which is uh, you know, a very high price, relatively speaking, uh, you know, the highest that we've seen since the collapse in the, the summer of 2014. So that, that's the orange line and that looks pretty good. And then we look at the blue line, which is the actual rig count here in the state of North Dakota. And we saw a collapse with COVID um, from just over 50 rigs, basically down to zero. And now these numbers ended, uh, these are Baker Hughes numbers. Uh, these numbers ended uh, on the 9th. Uh, according to Department of Mineral Resources in North Dakota, we're up to 23. But you can see this huge recovery in oil prices, but not a commensurate increase in the number of oil rigs. And clearly, thinking about economic activity, jobs, tax revenue, wealth creation, and the like, it, it's lagging a bit. And so my, my the, I continue to watch this, you know, waiting, hoping uh, that that those rig council will start going up uh, more than they have been. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is kind of a macro issue uh, as it relates to inflation. So those numbers just came out, very high numbers. That the, the the number that causes probably the the most uh, you know is most newsworthy is the one in the upper right hand corner, which is that five point four percent number for the 12 months that just ended, you know, and that that's a little bit of a, a, a line with statistics type issue again, because we're coming off of 2020, where things were certainly tough. For me, more importantly, is we can just look at the the month over month uh, change in, in the price level, uh, which was almost 1% in a single month, which is, you know, a huge number. Uh, and then also looking specifically at where that came from. Most of it is coming from energy. Uh, you may see that as you're at the pump, um, as well as a, a little bit at the gas station. We kind of just go through each one of those. Uh, food, both home and away, uh, was up almost, you know, 0.8 percent. I mean, that, that's a substantial number if it continues, right? There, there is this huge discussion going on right now. Although I think uh, more and more uh, folks are kind of coming to 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 grips or uh, open to the idea that we might be in, entering at least a, a, a somewhat inflationary period. Uh, the the Fed has said that you know they're they still have all of their tools at their disposal and they're ready to, to act when necessary. Um, what we're seeing those types of things, uh, and some of this does go back to uh, Tim's 
uh, observation too about all that help wanted. And, you know, a lot of these costs, you know, you do have these underlying commodity costs, energy can quickly uh, impact much of the economy, labor can impact much of the economy as well. Uh, we can look at those energy numbers specifically. Again, we are entering the, 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 the summer season. So some of these, uh, you know, for the month over month, so that left, that left circle, uh, which has that, you know, that two, two and a half percent change for different for different energy, for different fuels that folks buy. And then, of course, if we go back to a year ago, we've seen tremendous increases. But again, those are uh, somewhat uh, distortionary, don't really tell the, the true picture. Uh, the one that I've been looking at, because I have a daughter who needs a used car, uh, is the, the increase in the price of used cars, uh, up almost 50% over last year, 10% uh, in the month of June. And so some of this is being driven by uh, the chip shortage or the the uh, potential chip shortage. Some of it is also just uh, the the automotive industry enjoying uh, significant demand for new vehicles, uh, and uh, you know taking advantage of those high prices and kind of slow walking vehicles to the the showroom floor, uh, as well as just catching up with the pent up demand from COVID. Uh, but those prices are certainly high, and they're expected to to last for through at least the end of the third quarter and likely persist for, for quite some time. So those are the comments that I had, and that concludes our, uh, our, our prepared remarks. And now we can move over to, to Q&A if there's any questions from the participants. And I think we must have done a fantastic job today, Frame. <laughs> The one, the one thing I would mention in the WASD, you didn't get into it. I thought their, their 5.2 billion bushel number for corn for ethanol was, you know, that's, I think that's a pretty easy one for them to pick. And, and I, I think they're pretty much spot on. And it could be that everybody's on mute and ready to go to the lake for the weekend. Yeah, that's, that's probably it. All right. Well, it, uh, just to, to remind everybody, this is a monthly webinar. Our next one is Thursday, August 19th uh, at 1 p.m. Again, at the same site. I do need to update the, the webinar location. We have revamped our website uh, within extension in the Egg Hub site, and you may have seen that. I'll send a follow-up uh, when we do upload the slides and the recording of this webinar so you know where it's at. Uh, the, the URL for this webinar will remain the same, but the actual location on the web of where we'll have a repository of the slides and the recordings you know, has changed. But that should be available to everyone. Um, and if you, if you don't see something uh, and can't find it, uh, just reach out and we'll make sure that you can get that information. Since I don't hear or see any questions coming up, if, if there's anything any panelists want to add, or if you're also uh, ready for the weekend or or for the <laughs> next thing. All right, well, hearing none, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and we'll send out a, a blast as soon as everything's uploaded to the web. Thanks. Mm -hmm.